Good morning, friends. It's a blessing to see you and to welcome you into the life of Sycamore Church. This is a familiar place to many. We hope it becomes a familiar place to those of you who may be here for the first time. This is also a loving place, and we hope and pray it is a place where you feel the pulse of God and the promises of God's care for your life. Please feel that you're among friends. That's indeed what Jesus called his followers. Uh, We encourage you, if you're among us and you don't have a congregational home in the greater Cincinnati area, to make this your church home. Our next new members class is going to be on Tuesday night, February the 21st. Uh, There'll be a dinner component. It goes from 6 to 8.30. Child care will be available. And we would just ask that you contact the church office to register. You can also make a note on the friendship pad that we encourage you to pass and pay sincere attention to those good souls that are seated near you. Uh, We want to highlight for you that uh, we are nearing a time of our upcoming responsibility to be a host for IHN, the Interfaith Hospitality Network. During that week, this church becomes home to a number of people in the wider community who don't have a place to currently call home and lay their head. And we know enough to know that it takes the efforts of about 100 volunteers to pull this off, and there are all kinds of opportunities to be supportive We would just draw your attention to a table in the connector where you could share something of encouragement for this ministry. Uh, It is a delight to invite you to a reception following this service in Harper Hall in celebration of 60 years of marriage for Bob and Mary and Chase. Uh, Please drop by their table and just congratulate them and enjoy some of their hospitality. We also want to be mindful that uh, during the month of January, the dinner portion of our Journeys program is free, but we need your reservation. All ages are welcome because they're activities for young and old alike, and there's some adult ministry signups that you would want to note, variety of enrichment opportunities. It would just help us if you could register following uh, this worship service, particularly for the meal component. There are other things you're going to want to note. Uh, An activity for our in-betweeners, a chili cook-off. The family ministries camp in later in the month. The upcoming Financial Peace University classes. There's so many other things. Just be alert and read. We hope this morning to give you a little bit of an update about some of the very special things that are happening as a part of our renovation and expansion effort. And here to tell us a little more about it is a member of the facilities development team, Ron Green. Good morning. Uh, If you haven't noticed, we do have a construction project underway. Um, It's very exciting for us to start to see the dirt moving. And uh, unfortunately, the weather uh, with the Crazy rainfall we had last year. We're about six or eight weeks behind where we hope to be at, at this time. But uh, they're still working through all that, and uh, we have made progress. Uh, things that we've completed, um, notice the uh, site has been cleared. Uh, most of the grading has been done so that uh, the construction can start on the building. Um, storm sewers and all that that goes underneath the parking lot and around the building, that's been completed. Uh, There's a new retention pond that's behind the sign on the corner. Uh, It's a little bit deeper than it's going to be when it's completed. That'll be filled in as construction progresses, and so it'll it'll be there, but it won't be quite as deep. Um, Sewer line, if you were here around Christmas, you notice we had uh, a new sanitary sewer line put in through Harper Hall. That's going to connect the new building uh, to our sewer line that's out by the street. It saved us quite a bit of money. Uh, so it was advantageous for us to, to run through Harper Hall, that's, and that's all completed. Um, things that are underway, I'm sure you've noticed that uh, there's some basement walls going in. 
and the footings for that. Uh, they should hopefully be completed with that pretty soon, probably in the next week and a half if uh, the weather cooperates. Uh, you know how winter weather is. Um, things that should be uh, underway this January, the rest of the month, is the steel deck structure that goes on the basement. Uh, that will be put in place uh, the, to carry the floor. Also, uh, all the under slab plumbing that will go in the new building, that will be put in place, so you'll start to see piping go in for that. And then also uh, pouring the first floor slab over the basement uh, that uh, the walls are going in now. So you'll hopefully start to see that very soon if the weather cooperates with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Sycamore. The psalmist says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I suggest to you that the love of Christ can do amazing things. The love of Christ can open our eyes and completely revolutionize our thinking about what matters most in life. The love of Christ can lift us above what is ordinary and everyday and make us believe that forever is not nearly long enough. The love of Christ can open our hearts to convince us once and for all that miracles really do happen. And I further propose to you that collectively we lift up our voices this morning as we pray, our hearts as we listen, and our souls as we sing to amplify the gratitude that we feel toward our God, beginning with our opening hymn number 139, Come Thou Almighty King. Of our 
our lives. Christ our living Lord. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. If we are in Christ, we become new persons. The past is finished and gone. Everything becomes fresh and new. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. take your few Bible and turn in them with me for our scripture lesson for this morning found in the Gospel of Mark. It's going to be chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. You can find it in your pew Bible on page 1576 and 1577. And I'd invite you to follow along as I read the scriptures aloud. Let us open our ears to the hearing of God's word to us this morning. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, beginning... Verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is time for the children's message. I never know if I'm going to be on, so I'm like, it's time. Come on down. Good morning to you. I'm going to talk a little bit about gift giving. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I have to give a gift to somebody I don't know real well that's not a family member, I get a little anxious because, like, if you're going to a party, um, you don't want to have the, the gift that they kind of go, really, this is it? And you also don't want to give them something so lavish that everybody else feels uh, like, you know, I, I overdid it. So I, I get a little bit stressed when I have to give gifts. Um, but I brought some gifts today that I have gotten over the years to kind of express to you some ideas of gift giving. First off, I have this quilt. When my daughter Sarah was uh, born, my mom made this quilt for her. Now, Sarah is almost 17 years old, and obviously I still have it. I love this. I will never get rid of this. I'll give it to Sarah someday. Now, this next thing is also a quilt. I used to be a school teacher, and when I was um, pregnant with Sarah, um, a woman who was a parent in my class was really very, very poor. She didn't have very much to give. And uh, the, the kids all were giving me showers and that kind of thing. And she handmade this for me. 
And I knew at the time what, not only what it meant to her to, to do this when, you know, other people were going out and getting me gift certificates that, you know, babies are us. And obviously, again, look, I still have it today. Now, my daughter, Amy, in kindergarten, gave me this little pen for Mother's Day. And I still wear it once in a while, and I still have it. I love it. Here is a bookmark. It says, my favorite teacher, Mrs. Ferris, fifth grade, 1991-1992, was given to me by a young lady who shared the same last name I did. And in fact, about a week ago or so, maybe longer, she found me on Facebook and she said, hey, sis, is that really you? So I need to get back in contact with her. Wouldn't she be surprised to know that this handmade bookmark means so much to me that I keep it in my Bible at home? My last gift is something, if I can get it out, that my daughter Sarah made for me. She wrote me a poem one year for Mother's Day or Christmas, and I keep it, and I have it in my office, not only here at work, but my office at home, because she gave this, saying that she loves me, and she gave it from the heart. Well, that's what I want to talk about, is the fact that all of these things are things that matter to us from the heart. Now, in our scripture reading today, Jesus was people watching. You know, sometimes you go to the mall and you're kind of standing back and you're watching everybody and you go, oh, look at them. You know, he was kind of in the back of the church, people watching. And, you know, he saw these people who came in that were dressed all to the hilt, you know, had the nicest camel parked in the best spot. And, um, you know, they would come in and they would be very, very flashy and they would throw their money in the offering. And then he saw people that maybe weren't as flashy and didn't have such a nice camel, but um, wanted everybody to know that they had given. So you know how people will like shake their money in their pocket and, and they drop it so that when it clinks into that metal thing, everybody knows, okay, that person's giving. And here comes this little widow. And she has what's called two mites, which they say is less than a penny. She didn't flash. She didn't have great clothing. She just stuck it in the offering. And Jesus, people watching, nudged his disciples and said, now that's what I call giving. And the reason is we think, well, it means that they're supposed to give. We're supposed to give absolutely everything we have because that's what that widow did. That's all the money she had, and she gave it. But what Jesus loved about it was that she gave it because she loved God. She gave it from the heart. It mattered to her that she honored her God by giving what she had. Just like all these gifts honored me in some way and have remained special because they came from the heart. So, you know, God doesn't want us to give and announce it. He doesn't want you to serve in Sunday school or or do these really, really great things and then go out and brag about it. What he wants you to do is do the things that you do and give the money that you give because you want to serve him not because you want to show how great you are to everybody else. And that, to me, is kind of what the widow's might is all about, is that we are showing God how much we love him by serving him. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God, you know our heart. Help us to be true to our heart and to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Friends, we also want to take a moment and greet all those who are joining us via the stream. Um, there are eight states and Beijing represented this morning and those who are watching. And whoever is in China, you're staying up late to join us and we honor that. And it's not our daughter who's in Hong Kong right now. So uh, what a privilege uh, to welcome you into our life and work. Will you please pray with me? Oh God, give us hearts eager, ready, willing to be stirred by the generosity of your unfailing care made real in Christ our living Lord. Amen. Some of us are trying to put our lives together in a way that has greater meaning and influence, in a way that is more God-honoring. And if you're striving to do that, and it is a worthy undertaking, you will find no better guide, no more thoughtful life coach than our Savior, Jesus Christ. This Lord is unfailingly generous to us. You think about the generosity of what he provides to us, the generosity of his time, the generosity of his energy, the generosity of his presence, the generosity of his mercy, the generosity of his service, the generosity of his love, the generosity of his faith, the generosity of his life poured out for us. This Lord is unfailingly generous and he loves to teach about generosity, which brings us to our passage today. The widow's might, many of you might have been acquainted with the widow's might before, but if not, it is different than other mites. You know ear mites, you may know dust mites, but this mite might be a little different because really what it is, is a small gift. Not an insignificant gift. Jan does such a wonderful job of inviting us into the story. The woman comes into the temple and gives her two coins. She doesn't hold on to one of them. She releases them both. This story becomes a window through which we see God's kind of generosity in action. But sometimes we might have paid so much attention to the might itself, we may have forgotten a little bit about the giver of the gift. She is widowed. We sometimes look on that experience strictly from a 21st century mindset. I visited with a friend this week who was recently widowed and asked her to share with me some things about that experience for her. One of the things she added was that you could never anticipate what that reality is like until you are there yourself. We don't know the conversations that might have been going on. Will anyone ever love me again? Or how am I going to financially survive when I have so few resources? My friend observed that if your marriage was satisfying, then chances are you might be willing to give it a go again. And if your marriage was less than satisfying, you might be content to remain single for the rest of your life. We don't know anything about this woman. We don't know her age. We don't know if she had any biological children. We do know that in our present day culture, half of the adults in our nation are single. And that if 
you want to work, chances are, regardless of your age, you can find some kind of opportunity. But my friend kept pointing back to the first century. She was wanting me to not let go of how intense the dynamics would have been in the culture of Jesus' day for the survival of a widow. She said, we can't overlook that. Now, there were prescriptions in Jewish law about how one who was widowed ought to be regarded and supported. But once again, some of the social service supports aren't there. There's no Social Security. There's no Medicare. There's no Northwestern Mutual. There's no metropolitan life. And if this woman had been an only child, and if she had given no birth to children of her own, she could have felt devastatingly alone. Even without any kind of a family network, we don't know. What we do know is that if she had deep financial need, there were very few ways you could make money if you were a woman. A woman in that culture was regarded as being a possession. Her own sense of stature was directly tied to that of her husband. And so to go it alone would be a hard and rigorous thing. We also know that Jesus had special affection for those who were widowed. She becomes the unlikely poster child for generosity. First off, she's a woman. And in that culture, the role model lifted up would generally not be a woman. And she is widowed, which means that her whole social network may have changed. And in some ways today, that still happens for those who are widowed. She comes into the temple and makes her gift, but it's not about the amount of money. It is about what prompts her participation in giving. I believe we see in this lady a demonstration of gratitude. Now, if anyone has reason not to be grateful, it probably could be this lady, but that's not where she's coming from. That's not where her spirit leads her. She is prompted to gratitude because perhaps in a way that we have yet to discern, she sensed God's faithfulness and steadfastness with her during this whole ordeal and all the twists and turns that she had to navigate. She knew God was faithful. And she cannot help but express it. And so, of course, her kind of generosity has transforming quality because of what prompts it on the inside. You don't give like this out of a sense of duty or legal obligation. You do it to honor one greater than yourself. She is thanking God for God's commitment to her when everything else has gone away. Now, there is an antithesis to this kind of approach, and that is a kind of abject selfishness and spiritual poverty, the kind of outlook and orientation which tragically turns in upon itself and is self-preoccupied, self-focused, unwilling to look beyond itself. No wonder we don't find much of God 
in that reality because we have closed God out of the conversation. One of the advantages of having been in the ministry for 35 years is you have an unexpected backlog of experiences that sometimes speak to you when you least expect them to. Somehow this week onto my radar came something from quite some time ago. A young person in their 20s came to me wanting cash. And I knew enough to know that the cash would probably go for drug or alcohol use. I knew the individual at a distance. And here's what the person said to me. This is how they made their appeal. They said, you mean to tell me that all of those Sundays, when that offering plate came by me, and I had nothing to put in it, and I reached down deep into my pocket and Put something there when I could have been justified in taking something out of the plate. You mean to tell me that that counts for nothing? I said, well, what really counts is the fact that you have a family, a good family, a strong family, and if they are not willing to be responsive to you, then you have a whole nother series of problems. They went away bitterly angry. The deep tragedy is in a few more years, they were dead. There's something about being preoccupied with our own self and our own stuff. And only what matters to you and to me, that it kills, it maims, it crowds out other things that are good that could recorrect and transform our outlook and welcome God into the conversation. Friends, we strangle our lives when we only make them about our own life. And when we leave out of that conversation something that Dr. Martin Luther King said so well, all of us can know the gift of service. And in so doing, dignify life. The most generous people I know are the most grateful people I know. And they're not giving against some kind of a bar or a percentage with their life, with their resources, with their time, with their energy. They are doing it out of response to what they believe is the inexpressible and unfathomable love of God that has been lavished upon them. So they look for ways to give back. They too could recount some of the curveballs and missed connections that have dotted the landscape of their lives. The black eyes that have come their way, pardon the pun. They choose not to focus there. They choose to focus on God's faithfulness to them in all of that and more. And they look for a way to express their gratitude. One very wise person put it this way. If there was to be only one prayer that you would pray with your life, let it be this prayer. Thank you. It's been said that this widow, by her actions, was demonstrating a willingness to turn her life over to God. She was giving up control. She was willing to step into God's life rather than believing that she had to be in control of it all, as you and I sometimes feel. 
She was willing to honor the movement of God that she had already come to recognize as being the most important piece in her life. You know, either this thing we call God's grace in Jesus Christ is the greatest reality, the defining focus of what matters in our world, or it's not. There's no middle ground. And she says that this walk with God is greater than any treasure. So she can't help but want to give it away. Now catch yourself. Join me in this. It may slowly creep up upon you and you're in a restaurant with a friend. And halfway through your dinner, you catch yourself saying something like, probably took five minutes or so to get our water. Or this food isn't as tasty as I remember it being. Or our waiter, they're not overly friendly, must not need a job. Or this restaurant's looking a little shabby. All the while, you're kind of making note of reasons to allow you to justify stepping back from generosity. And so you reduce what would be considered your wildly generous 15% tip down to about 5%, believing that you're making a point. Of course, I'm not saying allow someone to abuse you or to treat you shabbily. But if you seek to find reasons to justify your lack of generosity, you can find them and you'll pay that price. Or if you want to find reasons to encourage your own generosity, you can find those reasons and be blessed by it. Because it is really fundamentally your value system in motion and how you acknowledge and translate God's goodness and generosity to you. And ultimately, it has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with the state of your heart and how central this grace is to your own sense of well-being. Sometimes it almost leaps out in ways that you don't expect. I remember one time when I completely bypassed any committee, even the session, to take something to a congregation I served. What I took to that congregation, which was committed on a weekly basis to feeding several hundred people, was an invitation to step into a series of holiday dinners, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, as a way of inviting many of the disconnected people in the community that might have been homeless and somewhat hopeless into the umbrella of the wider life of the church at a significant time in our life and fellowship, to feel a part, to have a place to go when those holiday times would come near. And I propose that to help undergird this, we would begin a holiday dinner endowment. The next morning, Monday morning, a retired school teacher called me. And here's what she said. She said, I have a $10,000 CD that just came due. I so believe in that vision that I'm going to sign it over to the church as a way of being a seed gift for this new ministry. And then she added, and I believe in it so much that I don't even want any tax credit for it. You'd never catch me saying that. And at that first 
holiday dinner at Christmas time that was in part provided by her generosity, she was there serving. And by God's grace, something of that experience served her. She was blessed. God's kind of generosity is like that. It serves us as well. And it knows how to keep moving as only the Lord can make it happen. Thank you, Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. in our hearts to come before God with common concerns and lift them up in a ministry of intercessory prayer. We have some listed in our bulletin, and I want to invite you to take these, these uh, lists home and look at them periodically and lift these folks' names up to the Lord God as He opens His ear and His heart listens to our requests and responds to our needs. We're always mindful that there are many folks on here not listed in in our family, church family, and in our worlds that need our prayers, unspoken requests, um, things of the heart, and we want to remember those also. So I invite you to join me as I lead in this prayer of our common concerns. Let's bow before God. Gracious, loving, and almighty God. For this hour of worship, we give you thanks to come into this place we call a sanctuary to drop away the baggage of our lives, sometimes to let go of the wounds and the hurts or the confusion, to come into your presence in a unique and worshipful way, Lord, and, and be renewed in our walk of faith. For this opportunity, we give thanks to reconnect with you. Some of us, perhaps, Lord have been distant from you for a long time and are just getting back on track with you. Others of us, Lord, have been routinely hooked up here with the church and faith and worship, but we always need new nourishment for the days ahead and the days we live. Be generous, Lord, as you always are. 
and granting the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds and our souls, renewing us daily in the likeness of Christ Jesus, bringing us to become what you have created us to be in your family and in fellowship. Always teach us from your word, Lord, for we need that guidance, that wisdom, that truth that comes from your word. And Lord God, we are always mindful that these we've listed as needing your healing blessings, your presence, your, your, your guidance and decisions and other needs, Lord, that you hear our requests and you accept them and you bless these folks in the needs that they have. Bless those who are still working, serving in our military in harm's way. Lord, we are ever mindful of those returning home who had to have their legs amputated. Life changes. Life isn't what we expect it to be often or hope it to be. But it is life given by you, God, and continue to bless it. Be with those families whose loved ones return wounded with your healing presence and your help, your guidance and drawing closer together. Lord, bless those who struggle daily to manage the difficulties of their lives and and need help every once in a while, just need someone friendly and caring to come alongside and say, you're here, let me help. Guide us to be those people, Lord. Grant to us a spirit of generosity of knowing how we can give of our finances, but as much as of ourselves to those who are around us, that we can help make a difference and do it in your name. Lord God, may your generosity upon us stir within us a generosity for others, that you be honored, glorified, that we know the blessing of walking in your spirit. And Lord God, in your generosity... We want to pray, being faithful to you, even as our Lord has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With hearts filled with gladness, full of cheer, because of the love that our God has given to us, let us demonstrate it in the presentation of tithes and offerings.
loving and gracious and almighty God are these expressions of our devotion, our love for you and your kingdom's work. Receive these expressions of that devotion, Lord, and bless them by your Holy Spirit. Empower them to continue spreading the good news of your gospel, of the love that you have for us in our hearts, in our minds, in our families and friends, even to the ends of the earth. To your honor and glory in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as only you can, go with joy, live in faith, believe that life is good, and if you find it not, help make it so to the glory of God who made us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, friendship, and power of the Holy Spirit lead us forward together each step of the way. Amen. Amen.